for change is at the heart of your ability to make it happen. Welcome to Turning Inward. I'm Vivian Carrasco, your midwife, teacher, and host for this podcast. Together, you and I are going to navigate the interior life. And we're going to do that by unearthing our personal truths, our own insight, and our inner knowing. These are weekly teachings that are brought to you by hard-nosed scientific evidence focused on spiritual direction with integrity and self-awareness. In two words, this is your inner work. So the very first thing that I want to say before we get started is for both you guys, Sage and Paula, you have a special bonus for making it here because I know how valuable your time is and I am in humble gratitude for you joining me because you could be doing a thousand other things. And Paul, I know you'll be going to a party later. So yay. But there's, as we go through this, part of what this requires, this sort of transformational journey is a, a different kind of imagining. And because you're on the call, whatever this thing is with me live, I am gifting you a session to go over your how do I figure out what my goals are? So I think that that would be the most helpful to you. I am allowing you to gift that to someone else if it's not something that you want to take advantage of. But I am excited to support you in your commitment towards this transformation and this becoming and beckoning that is happening in your heart because it is a very tender place to be. So that's what I'm giving you. And I'll give you details about it as we go a little bit later. But the first thing I'd like to do is just take a couple of seconds to settle and lengthen our breaths. I'll be doing the same thing. Just sort of connecting ourselves across geography, across time and space, digitally, sort of electronically, energetically holding each other's hands or, or greeting each other. Even though we can't see each other and you can see me, we're very much connected. Just wanted to take a, a moment to honor that. We will be doing some writing so if you happen to have uh, your favorite pencil, your favorite pen, piece of scratch pad or a, a paper nearby, wonderful. If you don't, then take a couple of minutes just to get that near you. There is something very, very special that happens when you move an idea or an intention, even a wish from your head through your heart and into your hands. And we want to take advantage of the magic that happens as those electronic ideas cross over the midline brain from the creative to the logical side, and you create something as you write. So not typing with tips of the fingers, but actually writing. And if you want to take it a step further, if you are ready for a challenge, then write with your non-dominant hand. So officially getting going, I'm going to start with a poem. This poem made a really huge impact on my heart as I read it. And so I want to read it to you as a way to set the stage for this experience that we're going to have together. It's called Walk Slowly by Dana Falls. It only takes a reminder to breathe, a moment to be still, and just like that, something in me settles, softens, makes space for imperfection. The harsh voice of judgment drops to a whisper. And I remember again that life isn't a relay race. They will all cross the finish line. That waking up to life is what we were born for. As many times as I forget, catch myself charging forward without even knowing where I'm going, that many times I can make the choice to stop, to breathe, and be, and walk slowly into the mystery. There is one thing that I am absolutely convinced about. I am convinced that it is easy to move fast. It takes mastery to slow down, to move through your life like you're in water, maybe even in mud. Moving slow is the mastery that this mystery is going to require of you. Because moving fast is easy. Moving fast, for me actually, helps when I was moving fast in my 20s. I don't move as fast anymore. <laughs> when I was moving fast, I moved so fast and so long and so hard that I probably would be asleep before I hit the pillow just because I would exhaust myself in doing. The most critical piece of walking into a mystery, of allowing your becoming to wash over you, is to begin to slow down. 
that slowing down is what allows you to hear beyond the noise of that, you know, that narration, the story that's going on in your head into that deeper sense of what's actually true for you. The whispers that don't scream at you, that only whisper at your heart, that wait patiently, that seed of becoming remains in you. You're not going to miss it. It's not going to go away. You're not going to lose it. It stays with you until you're ready to nurture it. So I wanted to start us with that beautiful poem by Dana called Walk Slowly, because that is the posture of this unfolding, of this blooming of your soul, of your spirit, of this new being that's coming forward from you. It's a slow walk. It's a slow, slow walk. And there's only just enough light. You can imagine you're holding a lantern. There's only just enough light for you to take one or two steps. So this journey is always going to be scary in that way because you'll only see the next step or the next step after that. You'll have a vision for what the whole um, becoming or becoming or being can be. That'll be a vision. It won't be a target that you're moving towards. It'll be a, an image that you're forming that's coming into focus as you take each single step. So that's the first thing that I wanted to say is it requires a thing that I'm calling deep time. The minutes, the hours, the days, the weeks, and the months are there. And obviously we're going to move in that world, but this is a consistent stepping forward one step at a time. And sometimes a couple of steps back, but always in this mystery that is slow. So I'm convinced that to master this mystery, we have to slow down. What I have for you is just a couple of comparisons of what this calling forth of your heart, this breaking open of your heart is going to more than likely show you. And I say more than likely because I'm saying that based on my own experience and my own research and actually the writings of 2000 years, this sort of mystical tradition, this wisdom lineage. It generally happens a certain way, but it will always be uniquely your way. There is no one on this world that can tell you what is true for you. I can't. If there's anyone that does, question it. Because you are the only one that knows what's true for you. And it's a difficult time because there's a lot of questioning happening. And maybe a lot of isolation that you're feeling. I know that I felt, even when I was surrounded by a lot of people, that I was alone. That no one understood what was happening to me. And that it would never be better. But I can promise you that I can promise you it will be better. And if it's not better... It's not done yet. And that is the truth that I believe. So thank you, because this takes a very courageous, very brave heart to walk. And I just want to start us off by saying that walk is slow. So in your journey of becoming, I want to start with the carrot and the stick. So, and that's what I'll do as I go through all of these little tangents that I'm going through. It'll be this and then that. So there's a carrot, which is your motivation. And then there's the stick. We've got to drop the stick. There is no way to coax your soul out through judgment and through pushing and hustling. It doesn't work that way. It's like a wild animal that you sense is in the bush or behind the tree line. You wait patiently until it decides to come out. So if you imagine a wild animal, even a dog, if you take a stick and you hit it, I mean, that's just not going to bring forth its best being. And it is the exact same way with you. So I am pleading with you to drop the stick. And just like in this beautiful poem, it says, for as many times as I forget, catch myself charging forward without even knowing where I'm going, that many times I can make the choice to stop, to be, and walk slowly into the mystery. So as many times as you pick up the stick to chastise yourself, to judge yourself, to doubt yourself, you can also make the choice to put the stick down. So putting the stick down is, I try not to hit the desk because it moves. Putting the stick down is the first, once we know that this is going to be a long journey, we're going to take a slow walk, then we put the stick down. And then the fun part, and this is the part where I want to work with you one-on-one, -on -one, is to create the carrot. And the way that you create the carrot, and this is a fun way, because we're going to do a piece of it now. And if you want to go into more in depth and more detail, that's what the one-on-one -on -one session will be for. But you create the carrot by linking to your values. What's most important about linking your actions to your values 
is that it creates this deep yes inside of you because it's linked to your core values. What you believe matters most without linking, without hooking your actions, your carrot to your values, then you're doing something for someone else. And in my experience, doing something for someone else doesn't work out for that person or for myself. When I can find how doing something aligned with my values can serve that person too, it's a win-win. It's like a candle lighting another candle. There is no loss. There is no negotiation. There is no, you just light another candle. So linking your action to your values helps you to listen and attend to the presence that you really need to cultivate. You're cultivating presence. So imagine if the metaphor I want you to think about is a field that is bare. You turn the field, you plant the seeds, you watch it grow, and then you reap the harvest. That takes time. Right now, in this time, if it's the very beginning steps of your journey of becoming, you're tilling the field. You're sleeping, you're drinking water, you're dropping the stick. You're cultivating the earth, the soil of your heart, so that you can then plant the seeds. This is a, an interesting little segment for me because it makes me laugh. How do I figure out what I really want? How do you figure out what you really want? How do you figure out what really matters to you? And I laugh a little bit about it because more often than not, I can't figure out what I want on a menu. So I'm going to do my best to give you a few questions that will give you some an opportunity to do some inquiry and begin to figure out what you want, to sort of start to have that conversation with yourself. So to grab your pen or your pencil handy. The first thing I'd like for you to do is imagine that you're 94 years old. You're sitting in your comfortable chair. You just looked at, probably at the time, digital pictures of your life, of your family, of your memories, of all the meaningful moments you've had in your life. You're wrapped in a blanket. You've got your favorite beverage. You're listening to your favorite music, looking at a view that is just warming your heart. And at 94 years old, you're imagining all the wonderful things that have happened throughout your life. So that's your first question. You're at the end of your life, 94, and looking back without thinking, write down what mattered most to you. If you're feeling a little bit of resistance, try to use the opposite hand, your non-dominant hand. I write with my left hand, so write with your right hand. So you would write with your right. Allow this to be an exercise in imagination and possibility. And I wasn't going to do this, but I think I'm going to do this with you. 94 years old sitting in my chair. Well, you know, I've got a sly little grin on my face because I'm a bit of a troublemaker. And I'm thinking to myself, what's mattered most over my entire life? So I've got a couple of things written down. Just notice what you wrote down. Don't make any judgments on it. Don't make any plans yet. Just notice. That's a beacon. They are beacons of what matters. Your second question. Ask yourself who you are. So I'd say, Vivian... Who are you? And I want you to look deep, deep in the roots of who you are. More than likely, the first things that came to mind are roles that you have. I might say, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a sister, I'm a daughter. But look deeper than that. Look at the roots of you. Who are you across all those roles? Write that down. Another tool or technique for you to use if you're feeling like that's difficult for you to tap into, actually take your bare skin, hand to heart, feel your heartbeat. And as you ask yourself that question again, tune into that closed circle that you create when you put your hand to your heart. And with curiosity, the curiosity of a two-year-old, say, who am I? Your third question is, what is your truth? What makes you who you are? What is in your heart? What is your truth? So I'm just going to acknowledge that I feel some tension in my, like I can't breathe. Allow the questions to marinate. The answers don't have to come right now. They might come when you're in the shower, when you're washing the dishes. They might come to you over the course of an hour, over the course of days. Remember, this is deep time. This is not the kind of time that we probably experienced in school where a teacher asked you a question and you were to answer it right then. 
These are seeds that you're planting in your heart. I already feel the release. You can allow it to take time. The answers don't have to show up for you right now. As a matter of fact, if it's cloudy, if they're blurry, then that's actually more normal than having a very clear and direct answer hit your heart. It's not normal to have something just pop up and you go, oh, I know exactly who I am. I know exactly what I want. So it's okay that the answers aren't there. What's most important is that you're asking the questions. Because there are two things based on the research that I've read and the life that I've lived over the last four and a half decades that have significantly impacted the way I live and the quality of life I have. And the first is what question am I asking? Because there's a distinct difference in this type of questioning than in the questioning I might have asked before, which was, whose fault is it? Who's to blame? What's wrong? The life that I had when those are the questions that I was seeding into my heart is a distinctly different life than the one that I live now. When I allow these questions to stir my curiosity. So I'm going to repeat them. Who are you? What is your truth? And the final question, the big kahuna, right, is, and write this down with your dominant hand if you haven't already tried this. Who do you want to be? As you're considering that question, I'm going to just make a couple of statements that I believe are true. You have a unique voice. I believe that is true. Your note, your voice is required in order for the universe to have its song. Without your note, without you singing your note, then the song isn't finished. You have a voice, a unique voice, and it matters that we hear it. As you're asking yourself who you want to be, I want to tell you that you absolutely belong here. You absolutely belong doing this work. Who do you want to be? Because you have something important to contribute. You have something meaningful to give. You have something beautiful to create. Who do you want to be? Figuring this out is tough, and it's the work that we're here to do. As you consider who you want to be, I know that right alongside that question is a doubt or a fear. And I want to tell you with every fiber of my being that it's supposed to be there. That is part of your design. It is the small part of you, the lizard brain, the amygdala, the instincts that are designed to limit your risks because it's risky to become. So know that they're going to be in the passenger side. I think it was Elizabeth Gilbert who said, they're going to be there. You can look at them. You can talk to them. You can tell them, hey, I'm okay. I know the directions. I've got the map, got my hands on the steering wheel. And oh, by the way, I control the music. You're just here for the ride. Doubt and fear will not go away. They're going to come along for the ride, but they don't have to be in charge of where you go or what music you listen to. Good. Pop in any questions. If you have questions, I can see them. So we've gone over the carrot and the stick. We've gone over doubt being part of the deal. And you've started to ask yourself who you want to be. And David's making a lot of noise coming in and out. Can I give another example of your truth? Yes. So the question, what is your truth? What makes you who you are? What is at the heart of the real human you? And I say real because we have so many layers of culture and expectations. And what's coming up for me right now is that the truth of me is very small in comparison to all the layers of culture and expectation. Because when I pull away the truth of me, I have to get through being... Mexican, being raised in a large family, being a woman, being the oldest child, being all these things that were part of an experience that I had. But what was the truth of me before all that? What was in my heart when I came into this world? Maybe there are whispers of a personality that comes through that you try to hold back. Ah, there you go. Think of a thing or a part of you that you try to repress. And I'll tell you one that I've gotten really comfortable with lately. I cry a lot. I cry for happy things. I cry for sad things. I cry when I see a commercial and I used to repress that. And, you know, having a family of men sitting in a movie theater, God love them. 
they would give me like I call it the Carrasco look. They'd give me the Carrasco look when I'd be like sniffling. <laughs> like just experiencing the movie. If it was sad, I was experiencing it. So in those early moments of my becoming, I repress that. I judge that. So that's a good way for you to pinpoint what your truth is. What are you judging or repressing because someone else is looking? So we've got out part of the deal. We've got the carrot and the stick. When I was in school, I went to school a lot of years and I'll keep going to school all these years. They told me that goals had to be smart. So smart meant that they were specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time sensitive. I'm calling bullshit on that. Goals don't have to be smart. Goals that are aligned with your values are always illogical. They're always dumb. They're nearly impossible. That's what makes them goals that are aligned with your heart's values. Your values aren't born in the world. They don't know a calendar. They don't know what's real. They know what they dream. They know what they imagine. That is your goal. So that's how you move forward in this becoming. You throw those smart goals away. They're not realistic. And I'll give you the difference now and why I believe this so strongly. What I see, what I feel, what I experience, what I talk to folks about is this distinct difference between having a guiding star, like the three wise men when they were on their way to see the baby Jesus, the sweet baby Jesus. They had that star that was guiding them. They eventually got there, but they were just guided by that star. We don't know how long it took them. And then you can consider having a distant shore. If I'm in a boat and I see the shore, nothing is right with the world until I get there. And that happens to us as a human being because every time we achieve a goal, it's against our instinct to go, yay, we're done because we're not dinner. We're never done. We're going to go to the next milestone. That's our design. We can't fight the design. We can build some skills to master it, but we can't fight the design. So know that as soon as you achieve the next thing, and this is an achievement, you're going to achieve the next thing and you're going to want to achieve the next thing. It's just how you're designed. So if your only focus is that distant shore, if your only focus is that goal, that bullseye, then you're going to I'll tell you what happened to me. I thought that for me in my upbringing, school was special and different because like, honestly, I didn't even know what college was. I thought it was near San Marcos, Texas, because there was a city named College Station. And back then we didn't have Google. So I looked on a map when somebody said, are you going to college? I had no concept of college because it just wasn't in my experience. When I found College Station on the map, then I could very confidently say to someone, when they said, Vivi, are you going to college? Like, you should go to college. Of course I'm going to college because in my mind, I thought college was College Station. So I was cultured in a way of sort of revering this education. So I figured out what the real college was. I went, I got a bachelor's degree in psychology, and it didn't make me feel special, which is what I thought it was going to make me feel. It was going to make me feel special. It was going to make me feel smart and make me feel like a grown-up, honestly. So I got my master's degree. And... I walked the stage and I was like, mm, that didn't do it either. Lucky for me, by the time I got to the, my doctorate, and I think because it took me seven years to finish it, I knew at that moment that crossing the stage, and I built it into my speech that they said as I was crossing the stage, that it was simply the bridge to the next experience. It was a moment to look back at the experience of the you know seven years and say, hmm, that was pretty cool. And then continue. That's when I figured it out. That'll be cool. And then you'll go on. So when you are able to set a distant star, a distant vision that's aligned with your values, that inspires you forward, you will meet those milestones. You'll meet those goals, but they won't be where you stop because you'll always have something to reach forward to. And I'll tell you another thing that I believe and that I've even heard Oprah say. I like Oprah. What you can imagine, as big and as broad and as humongous as you think that you can imagine, the potential for what's inside of you is even bigger than that. It's more than that. Because I'll tell you, <laughs> David and I, I think this year we'll be married 26 years. I'm looking over like I can see him. It's a long time. We've been married a long time. And we used to dream. We used to dream so big. 
and because we had a lot of time to stay home because we didn't have money to go out. So we would dream and dream and dream. And he said, so he's always been in petroleum and logistics and, you know, that sort of field. So, and we both came from the same small town. And so I remember him asking him, what is the biggest dream that you can have? What is the absolute best job that you can have? And he was at this time a specialist in the army and Joshua was little. And he was a 77 Fox Trot. He was a petroleum something. He said, the best job that I can imagine is being the person who fuels the planes at the airport. That's the biggest, best job I can imagine. And we giggle when we look back on that now, because he's like, I really thought I was dreaming big. And I said, yeah, you did. Your dreams, your ability is beyond your dream. So when you think I can't, the only reason you're thinking you can't is because you haven't before yet. Your brain is designed to do that for you because it automatically does like a file, right? You say, I dream of this. And it looks in the file and goes, hasn't happened before, not going to happen because it looks in the past. Your brain isn't designed to design, to create a future. It's just, that's not what it's for. So your, so your goals aren't smart. They're dumb. They're almost impossible. And if they're impossible, they're good. And again, I'm not saying that you aren't going to have goals because the session that I've gifted everyone who's live is a goal setting session to put into action, like your one thing, your top project, your, and then refine your vision five years, then three years, then one year, then one quarter. And slowly, and this is the next step actually. So that's kind of what we'll be doing if you decide to take advantage of it. The next thing that I want to talk about is small steps and slow. I'm going to say slow again. It's a slow walk. The thing, so slow and small consistently. And the example that I thought of here was in a ritual fashion, like brushing your teeth. There's no story anymore about brushing your teeth. Maybe there was when you were three or four, but there's not anymore. You get up, you probably do your business and then you brush your teeth. Maybe. Is there a story that you have to brush your teeth? Is there a story that you don't want to brush your teeth? Is there a story that you're going to have to brush your teeth for the rest of your life? My hunch is there's probably not because you've gotten past that. It's become a ritual. So I love rituals. I love them. I love them. I love them. And that is the beginning of all the work that I do. And I'm creating a planner that I'll be able to share with you soon on building a habit. So you build into your day a habit or a ritual that moves you forward in your goals, that moves you forward in your aspiration, not the achievement, but your aspiration, that vision that you have. And there's a couple of ways that I like to do this. And there's a sort of ritual routine around the way that we look at things. So the first thing is you celebrate as you look at your ritual. You celebrate what worked. That's the most important thing. Always celebrate what works. It's kind of like the research on gratitude. The more grateful you are, the more things you have to be grateful for. The more that you celebrate every single step forward in your becoming journey, the more you'll have to celebrate. So always celebrate first. That is my role. It doesn't have to be yours, but I have found it to be fun and to work for me. The second thing is you look for clarity. And I frame clarity this way for a reason, because you're looking for what didn't work. So you're looking for clarity around what didn't work. So what did first and then what didn't. And the fun parts here are the two parts, because there's always going to be something that didn't work because life is an experiment. You're going to look for the insights. Why didn't it work? So that you can start to look at something different. And the fourth piece of that is the fun part. And that's the sharing, sharing with your buddy, sharing with your community, sharing with your journal, some form of sharing, some form of documenting that journey. I like to do it daily and then I do it weekly, monthly, and quarterly. And it's always a look back. What worked? What didn't work? What did I learn from it? And then maybe sharing. Small steps forward slowly, consistently with a ritual. That's my next segment for you, for your journey on becoming. The next one is to, and this is difficult. And I sensed sort of the difficulty in it when I was asking those questions about who you are and who you want to be. 
but it's to face those fears, to look those fears right in the face. And one of the things I did to prepare for this workshop is I looked back at the old notes of when I made the recommitment to continue on this path. Because the inspiration for this was in October of 2013. And I thought it was lovely and I was curious. And then I said, hell no, like I'm fine. Like really, no, like I don't need to do this and the world will be okay if I don't. October, 2013, I tried for a few months and then I let it go. And then in April of 2014 is when I had my near death experience, the car accident. And after that I recommitted <laughs> because I had a different experience and I had had so many fears holding me back that near death experience. And if you haven't heard it, I can point you to the podcast that tells you the story really comforted me in that it was going to be okay. And I could move forward. So you want to face your fears because they are your biggest obstacles. As I prepared for this, I looked back at, as I was coached initially through this and one of the fears, and it's really embarrassing and kind of funny to admit to. The biggest fear I had is that I would be like Oprah. Um, I'm probably never going to be like Oprah <laughs> in reality. And I really feel stupid that I thought that. And I don't want to be like Oprah, honestly. She's got just too many people that know her. But when I looked back at that, at the notes from that coaching call, what I recognized is, is that I didn't want someone to be inauthentic on why they were in relationship with me. And I got that because of my experiences in my life. So David was enlisted in the first 10 years in the army, and there's a distinct difference in the army between enlisted and officers. So I would move through the world in different circles and wives would talk to me and we'd begin to be friends. And then they would find out that I was the wife of an enlisted soldier and things would change. So it's like something would change. I didn't change. Nothing changed about me, but something would change once they, you know, figured something out. The same thing would happen in professional circles when folks would recognize or be told or somehow have an insight on either how much education I had or what kind of accomplishments I had in the past. And it would piss me off because I would be like, five minutes ago, you were treating me this way. And now that you know these things about me, now you're treating me this way. And I guess it would make me mad. So my biggest fear when I began to speak up to when I began to sort of stand up for this message was that people would one, not like me and two, that they would like me too much. And so it's really stupid. It's like my fear was covering all its bases. It's like, I got to figure out every single way to make you stop. So that was mine. Anticipate that you're going to have fears and that they are your biggest obstacles. The idea that you don't have the resources, the time, that you don't have the resources, the time, the ability, the skill, those are all stories. You've got exactly what you need right now to do everything that you need to do in the next two steps. And the next two steps will unfold everything you need to do for the next two steps. And that's how it works. One step right in front of the other, okay? Trust me on this, but test it. The next thing I have is feel versus think. And it goes along the same lines with your obstacles and your fears. Feel into what's right for you. Don't think about it. Feel into it. And there's all kinds of tools that I can teach you on how to do that or direct you to on how you can learn to do that. But the main message here is that you are smarter than your thinking. Your thinking the logical piece of your brain uses, and I think it's like 14 million megabytes per second of data and information, right? But when your whole being is in tune and you're listening to both the brain, not ignoring it, but listening to the brain, tuning into your heart and also following your gut instinct, it's from 14 million to 137 billion. So you're smarter than you're thinking. And this little section is about integrating all of you into your knowing, all of you, not just your brain. Your journey of becoming is 12 inches from here to here, from your head to your heart. Use all your knowing. The last piece of becoming that I think will be helpful for you on your journey is that you get a buddy, you get some support. 
you find a community. Now, I know that both of you are within university and I'm so happy that you're there. You don't know how much happy I am, but I am. I'm happy. What I love about within university is that we have creative tension is what I call it. Quarterly experiences in creative tension that allow you to experience, and this is the key, it's experience. It's not knowledge, it's experience. In order to become, you have to do it. So quarterly and within university, we take journeys that hold a kind of creative tension for you. I'm super excited about the book club that we've been going through the last four weeks and will continue for the next eight weeks. It is a creative tension that will help you unfold your becoming in community with others. That's what part of this is, is you don't do this in isolation. So you're doing it right because you're here. You're reaching out, you're looking, you're learning, you're experiencing. Even if it's you and your journal, it doesn't happen alone and you don't want it to. So oh, I'm also excited about the next one, but I'll hold on to it as a surprise for next quarter. Those are the notes that I made about your journey into becoming. The direct experience of right now is that I am warm. Uh, I have a jacket on. It's fairly, you know, it's the data. It is that I am talking and you're on the other end, that I'm in my office. These are all facts that I feel on purpose. That sounds so cheesy, but it's the only language I have right now. The feeling that I have in my heart is one of openness, of empathy, of contribution, of service. That is how I feel. That is the data that I have around me. When I use all my senses, that's feeling into it. The thinking is the story that what I'm saying doesn't matter. The story that it's a waste of time. The story... Any story, the narration that happens as you're doing, which is why I emphasized on the ritual, because a ritual happens without the story. It leaves that labor of moving the narration out of it because it happens by ritual. If one of the things I'll recommend during our session is that there's one thing that you do every day. Lots of people like to make to-do lists that are miles long. But what's the most important thing that matters? What's going to move you forward? There's only one thing on your calendar that day. And your ritual will become to get that one thing done. And I promise you that you'll see movement with that kind of focus. And maybe it becomes such a ritual that happens before email or it happens or before you go to bed, whatever it is. So feeling into it is feeling all your senses and pushing aside the narration pushing aside, not really push, but sort of gently nudge aside that story. Because when you're telling a story, you're thinking. And what you're thinking is good at is showing you all the ways that it could go wrong or that it's not right or that, you know, it's basically tilling the soil for doubt. So that's a little more I'm feeling into it. So I can do a quick review of the different points. And then what I'd like to do is just read the same poem that we started off with as a way to close our sacred circle and our time together today. And then I'll reach out to you individually on when we can schedule our planning session because the goals are important. They're just not what drives you forward. It's your vision aligned with your values that drives you forward. And that's what I felt like was the most important thing other than going slow to really convey in today's teaching. So in your journey of becoming, you drop the stick and you create the carrot. And that's your distant star aligned with your values. You recognize that doubt and fear are coming along for the ride. You call bullshit on smart goals and imagine as imagining as you can with the greatest possibility possible. You take small, tiny steps consistently, slow. You anticipate that they're going to be obstacles and they're more likely just your fears. You feel versus think into things. You get a buddy or support. And then you create a routine around celebrating clarity, insight, and community. And that is a kind of map for your journey to becoming. But what's distinct to say here is that a map is not the landscape. So when I, back in the day, right before GPS on my phone, there was an actual map that I would look at 
and I could see that I needed to go from point A to point B. But driving, walking that distance did not look at all like the map. So this is a map, but your journey is not going to be like this because it's not the terrain. And then I'm going to read, walk slowly again. So just relax. Close your eyes if you feel safe. Or just look out into the distance until it's kind of blurry. Putting your feet on the floor or on crossing your arms or your legs if you've crossed them. Placing your palms down for grounding or turning your palms up to receive. Lifting your chin slightly towards the heavens. Dropping your shoulders, pulling them back. Letting that tender space of your heart puff up. Walk slowly by Dana Falls. It only takes a reminder to breathe, a moment to be still. And just like that, something in me settles, softens, makes space for imperfection. The harsh voice of judgment drops to a whisper and I remember again that life isn't a relay race, that we're all going to cross the finish line, that waking up to life is what we were born for. As many times as I forget, catch myself charging forward without even knowing where I'm going, that many times I can make the choice to stop, to breathe, and be, and walk slowly into the mystery. Your journey of becoming is you bringing all of you to life, coming alive and giving from what was planted in your heart when you came here. It is my honor and my joy that you have made the decision to allow me time and space in your journey. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention. And I will see you all in the everyone somewhere through the interwebs or maybe in person soon. So there's a some time in next year, some event happening with hummingbirds that I think we're all going to gather and go to. It might happen. It's a possibility. So look for that. Okay. And you feel free to send me questions via email that you think of later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are wonderful. And this link will actually go right back to the replay. So if there's something that you want to go back to, to listen to, or um, want to go through those four questions on figuring out what you want in another session, which I actually encourage you to do, then those will be there. So you'll have that. And this is where I end the broadcast. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your Saturday. If something needs to change and you don't quite know what it is yet... Tune in and turn inward. I host an online learning community where we can figure it out together. Feels like a little family and it's a place where you can be supported and offer support because togetherness sparks change. Visit my digital home at viviancarrasco.com to learn more.